thank you, Lord, as we uh, open our hearts and minds tonight that we might comprehend and see the glory, that we might understand what you've done for us. And we want to thank you that the spirit of wisdom and revelation is going to rest upon each and every one of us, that we might see that there's more with us than them. We thank you for opening up our hearts and our minds to see the glory and experience the glory. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we have a pamphlet there you have in your hands, Ascended. You don't hear much about Christ ascended into heaven. But let's read this, and we're going to get a little gist of it and all about the resurrection. And we see here at the first scripture, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 1, 8. I want to go through that tonight if we have time. So Paul is speaking here. He says, "We." when you put that on the board, uh, Charles, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, put it in the King James verse. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, let's just concentrate on that for a while. It, it's hard to break from this natural world to be able to see into the spirit world of eternity. All of us, including myself, I've had to meditate on these scriptures. But notice what Paul says here. He says, we are confident. I say, and willing rather to be absent. Now let's ask ourselves a question. Are we willing rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord? Now just be honest. Quite a statement, isn't it? And Paul's confident. He'd rather be absent from this body. So now we know what is absent from the body is spirit, right? His spirit man is absent from the body. In other words, when he's saying that, I'm not on the earth anymore, but I'm in heaven, and I'm with the Lord. I was watching the people, about these young people on that ship. How many have seen that on TV, that this ship sunk and all? And how those South Korean people would moan and cry which, and grieve, you know? And grieving's okay. You need to grieve for a while. There's a, there's a normal grieving that we should grieve if we lose somebody. But Paul says we should not grieve as those that have no hope. That's in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, 14, right in there. Yeah, grieve, but not like those that have no hope. We have a great hope. And, and that's, that's very powerful. Now, when Paul is saying that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's confident. And he would say, I'd rather rather be absent from the body. <laughs> so I'm not going to push you too much on that, but you think it through. And if you're not there right now, that's okay. Uh, sometimes I'm there and sometimes I'm not. <laughs> Let's read on now and we'll come back to that. Joseph Parker, 1830-1902, was a beloved English preacher. When his wife died, he didn't have the customary wording described on her gravestone. Instead of the word died, followed by the date of her death, he chose the word ascended. Parker found great comfort in being reminded that though his wife's body had been placed in the grave, the real Mrs. Parker had been transported to heaven and into the presence of her Savior, when Parker himself died, his friends made sure that his gravestone read, Ascended, November the 28th, and the date, 1902. And that's what I told Susan, that if the rapture hasn't happened, put on my, my little stone there, write it on there. Ascended on a particular date. When a believing loved one dies, or when we ourselves face the process of dying, there's great comfort in the fact that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Death for us is not a dark journey into the unknown. It is not a lonely walk into a strange and friendless place. Rather, it is a glorious transition from the trials of earth into the joys of heaven. 
where we will be united with our loved ones in Christ who has gone before. Best of all, we will enjoy the presence of our Lord forever. Yes, when a believer dies, the body is buried, but not the soul. It has ascended. Oh, how blessed is the promise. When our spirit is set free, to be absent from the body means to live, O oh Lord, with thee. For the Christian, death is the doorway to glory. Get that down in your heart, down in your mind. It'll do wonders for you. Now, I want us to turn now, and uh, there's a scripture in Acts. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1, talking about the ascension. Now, Luke is writing, writing his letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, in the former account, that's verse 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the former account which I prepared, O Thess Theophil oh, hallelujah, Theophilus, I made a continual report dealing with all the things which Jesus began to do and to teach. So we have Luke pinning all of this down of what the Lord has done in this period of time on the earth right on to his ascension. So let's go to the next verse. And we're going to just read verse to verse there, verse to verse. Until the day when he ascended. And so we see that he made an account of this. Until the day that he ascended into heaven, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had instructed and commanded the apostles, special messengers, whom he had chosen. Okay, verse, next verse. To them also he showed himself alive after his passion, his suffering in the garden and on the cross by a series of many convincing demonstrations, unquestionable evidence, and unfallible proof, appearing to them during 40 days, talking to them about the things of the kingdom of God. So we know that when he was resurrected, he spent 40 days talking to the disciples, showing himself to many people, uh, Paul brings it up, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, about the 500 brethren. So he showed himself, to, that is, Christ showed himself to many people. So the proof is there. All of these people are witnesses. And Luke is writing this down and reminding all of us that we're not just believing fables, but we put our testimony on people that have seen the Lord in his resurrected body. And that's important to see. All right, let's move to the next verse. <clears throat> and while being in their company and eating with them, now I love that, Christ was in their company. He was eating with them. Remember, he's in his resurrected body right now, okay? He has not ascended to heaven yet. Forty days after the crucifixion, 40 days, he spent time with all these witnesses, all these disciples. He showed himself. He taught them. He instructed them. Uh, he ate with them in his resurrected body. Now, that's exciting to me because I love to eat. Of course, I know nobody here likes to do that, but I do. I love to eat. I love good food. All right, let's move to the next one. For John baptized with water, but not many days from now you shall be baptized with, placed in, introduced into the Holy Spirit. Now he's talking about the day of Pentecost here. We see that, don't we? He's talking about the day of Pentecost <clears throat> after he ascends into heaven that they all were going to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. That was on the day of Pentecost. So for John baptized with water, but not many days from now you shall be baptized with, placed in, introduced into the Holy Spirit. And that was on the day of Pentecost. That's Acts chapter 2. Everybody remembers that in their mind, see. All right, so he's projecting something there as he, as he uh, describes this. All right, let's read on. Let's look at verse 6. So when they were assembled, and, and who were they that were assembled? 
the Lord, the disciples were all assembled. They asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will reestablish the kingdom and restore it to Israel? From that one verse of scripture, you see the Jewish mind. Can you see the Jewish mind? What was on their mind? Their kingdom. Of course, you know, way back in their mind, they had probably imagined where they're going to be in the kingdom, you know, next to the Lord in charge or somewhere, you know. The human element is always there. You can see that. So that's what was in their mind. Okay. So, you see, this thing is a process of, of revelation knowledge unfolding on through the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul so much that they didn't know at that particular time, but it is a process of revelation knowledge coming into the body of Christ and to the disciples and the leaders of the church, how things were going to unfold. And so at this point, this is about all they knew. So let's read to the next one. So no, we're not going to do that at this moment. Now, how many of you know when the kingdom? Somebody tell me. The millennium. The millennium years. That's what they were looking for. The millennium years. Everybody, if you know what the millennium years, raise your hand. All right, you're out there. Very good. So that's in their mind. And all that was going to be on the earth. They had no idea that there was going to be 2,000 years of church age. Okay. All right, we don't have time to go into all of that, but I'm just trying to bring you along here. He said to them, it is not for you to become acquainted and know what time, what time brings the things, even a time of their definite period or fixed years and seasons, their critical niche in time, which the Father has appointed, fixed, and reserved by his own choice and authority and personal power. So there are certain things we will never know. Only the Lord God, the Father, knows. And he knows all the seasons. He knows the appointed time. He knows that Satan will be uh, manifest in his appointed time, not before, but until that appointed time that the Lord God Almighty, the Father, puts into place. So some things we just have to wait and let it unfold. Okay, now. But now look at verse 8. He's bringing them back to the, uh, their attention right now in verse 8. But you shall receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. Now when that was stated, you've got to remember there they were in one little geographical place in Israel. And today, where we are at, it has spread all over the world. Can you see that? That's powerful. Now, that should strengthen our faith. Jesus is speaking that. And they haven't even left Jerusalem yet. And he's saying to them, hey, you're going to preach this gospel around the world. Well, today, 2,000 years later, we see the gospel being spread all over the world, and we have a part in that, and we have a part in carrying out that great commission. Our, our uh, website now has over 6,000 messages going out to people that people have listened to. Here we are in this little church, and we speak to more people outside of this church than we do in the church. In one week, I think we had over about 100 people that we spoke to. So this is not just us here, us four, no more. But we are speaking to the world now, and God has given us that privilege to do that. So just keep that in mind when the devil thinks or tells you we're not doing nothing. All right, look at that. Let's go to the next scripture now. And when he has said this, even as they were looking at him, I got to see the picture. He was caught up, and a cloud received and carried him away out of their sight. Let me say something about the clouds. When you see the clouds in the scriptures, how many of you know that it was a cloud by day and a fire by night that guided the Israelites? You all remember that? See that cloud and a cloud? The cloud many times describes the glory of God. Okay? 
Many times it describes angels. It describes the glory of God. And a cloud received, now notice that, and carried him away out of their sight. Now think that through. What carried Jesus and his resurrected body out of their sight? Yolanda, tell me. You know it. You see it? He was caught up and a cloud received and carried him. You see that? How many sees that? <laughs> that's powerful, isn't it? See, that's revelation knowledge. Out of their sight. The glory. Ah, ah the glory. Powerful. So, here we see he ascended into heaven, and now he is seated at the right-hand side of the Father, interceding for us right now as our great high priest, which I read in Hebrews chapter 4 a while ago. You remember that? All right, the next verse. All right, who said, who said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? Now, who's talking? Angel. The same Jesus who was caught away. I love that caught away. Caught. There goes Bob. He's caught away. <laughs> hey, there goes Mike. He's caught away. This same Jesus who was caught away and lifted up from among you into heaven will return in just the same way in which you saw him go into heaven. All right? Now, at this point, I want to say something. Not much, they understood very little about the rapture here. Forget about the rapture. Basically, what he's talking about here is the second coming of Christ. When you read Daniel, it's about the second coming of Christ. The rock hewn out of the mountain shall destroy all these other kingdoms. There'll be one kingdom left, and that'll be the kingdom of the Son of God. See, at this point, they didn't know anything about the rapture. The rapture was a mystery until later on the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, and Jesus himself gives him the picture of the rapture. How many of you understand that? Okay, I, I've, been, I've been labored on that because I want you to see that. That'll help you interpret scriptures where we're at right here. Because right here, it's the second coming of Christ. This is what they knew. This is all they knew. Yes, there's pictures in the Old Testament about the rapture, about being caught up and things like that. But they didn't understand it. When you read this, they didn't understand about his death, burial, and resurrection until he opened their minds. How many know that? You read your Bible, you will know that that's, that's true. All right? <clears throat> Let's go to the next one now. Verse 12. Then the disciples went back to Jerusalem from the hill called Olive, Mount Olive. How many of you know now he's going to come back on that same mountain, Mount Olive, and it's going to split. And that's how one-third of the Jews in that last battle in Jerusalem when the nations were bearing down on the Jews, Christ will come down. They'll see him whom they have pierced. He'll land on that mountain. That mountain's going to split. And that one-third is going to go through that mountain. Just like they went through the Red Sea, they'll go right through that mountain to safety. Okay? All right, I'm just giving you a little picture of that. Okay, so then the disciples went back to Jerusalem from the hill called Olive, or the hill Olive, which is near Jerusalem, only a Sabbath day's journey, three-quarters of a mile away. So that's how far it was. Okay, Mount Olive. All right, let's go to uh, the next one. And we'll probably quit on this. <clears throat> and when they had entered the city, they mounted the stairs to the upper room. Now, you remember what happened in the upper room, where they were indefinitely staying. Peter and John and James and all of the disciples there uh, were staying up in the upper room. And that's when, the, of course, we know there's 120 up there when the Holy Ghost fell. Remember that on the day of Pentecost, 
and they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. Fire of tongues came down upon them, and God was giving them the anointing to go out and preach the gospel to the known world of that time, which the known world was right around the Mediterranean Sea. They didn't know nothing about America, Canada, South America. That's not, that's not in here. See, it helps you to understand the, the, the part of the world that they see. It'll help you to understand what's going on, okay? Today, we think of the world, all the whole world. But see, that, their world was just around, right around the Mediterranean Sea. Turkey, France, uh, uh, Spain there, Rome, Africa right in there, Jerusalem, the Arab nations in there, right in there. That was their world of that time, so you need to remember that. Now I want to, let's turn to, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and get back on the, uh, the ascension. But I, what I thought tonight we would go ahead and uh, that's the first scripture put on the board, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Now, when you, when, you read, when you read this later on, you'll go home. To, on the back, I got, some, I got some more goodies on the back of that, okay? So read that on the back of that paper when you get home. That'll help you understand some. Okay, now we're talking about ascension, heaven, resurrection, and Paul brings this up in 2 Corinthians. This is a very powerful chapter. For we know that if the tent, now identify the tent. What is he talking about? That's right, these bodies. Remember back in those days, they didn't have too many buildings like we have today. But they had a lot of tents. People lived in tents. They lived in some buildings. So he describes this body as a tent. that if the tent, which is our earthly home, all right, your body is, our bodies are our earthly home. These bodies are not built for heaven. So you must understand that death is a delivering power. How many wants to go to heaven in the body you got? So you must understand that God's plan is perfect. So he leaves these bodies here on the earth because they're earthly. These tents are not built for heaven. So he takes our spirit to heaven first. Then later on, these tents are readjusted a little here, a little there, transformed into the image of the body of Christ, and our spirit goes into that that, that body will be able to live in heaven, okay? So that's God's wisdom. See, when you see it as God's wisdom, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. But if we see it strictly on the level of earthly mentality, it's fearful and everything, okay? All right, I'm trying to bring you up to the heavenlies now. Let's move on. Look what it says. Uh, our t which is our earthly home, is destroyed, dissolved. Now, you might look at that and say, oh, that's awful. No, that ain't. That's great. I think this young man over here is getting it. Come on, I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you now. See, we don't look at it that way, do we? We just want to cling on to this old earthly clay, this old wore-out tent. My daddy loved this tent. My mama loved this tent. Honey, God's got a tent for us. So I'll shine that tent you live in right now, big time. See, I'm trying to get you lifted up into the heavenlies now. Okay, now don't get mad at me. Put that brick down. Okay, thank you. Now look, when is it? we have from God a building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So why get mad at God for destroying this body, which is only temporary anyway, made of dust? It goes back to dust. But he's got a brand new Cadillac, brand new body. Look at that. Let's read it. Well, we know. Say, I know. 
All right, we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, dissolved, disappears, ain't no more, we have from God a building, a house, a tent, if you want to say that, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, that should be an encouraging word. Go to the next one. This gets exciting. Now, look what it says. Here indeed in this present abode or body, we are right now in this present abode, because we yearn to be clothed over, we yearn to put on our celestial body like a garment to be fitted out with our heavenly dwelling. Now stop for a moment. All right, here indeed in this present abode or this body, right now we're in, we sigh and groan. You know, some of the groanings that I know I can look back at my life, I really, I really was because of this body I had. My spirit says, listen, we got a better body, a building in heaven. You know, just go to heaven and get into that building. And it won't have all this groan in the morning. I want you to look at the scriptures now. This is God breathed. We sigh and we groan inwardly because we yearn to be clothed over. We yearn to put on our celestial body, our heavenly body, like a garment to be fitted out with our heavenly dwelling. How many times have you ever gone to a Christian and say, are you, are, have you, are you yearning? And they say, well, yearning for what? Yearning for your heavenly building that's made by God, created by God. Are you yearning and groaning for that? Are you crazy? Am I crazy? I'm only, that's what I, how many sees it like I see it? Let's see. Now, you might not like it, but that's the truth. That's the truth. And what do we do? We hang on this old tent as long as, now that's natural, I know that. I still don't want to leave that banana pudding in the refrigerator. I'll leave it, brother. We've got better banana pudding in heaven. Okay, all right, let's move on. I want you to, I'm trying to encourage you to see the ascension that what the Lord has done for us now, he's gone to heaven to prepare what? A place for us. And this is what we're talking about. Paul's talking about that. All right, Ruth, go to the next verse. So that putting it on, so that by putting it on, now what are we talking about? Our heavenly, uh, our heavenly home, body, we may not be found naked without a body. So our spirit man don't want to run around naked. It wants a body. So we thank God that, that it won't be like that all the time. Even though we're absent from this body, we go up there. He's got another body. We won't be running around. How many ever seen little kids run around naked? Huh? Everybody, that's never that. Yeah, I can see all of you now running around naked now. Well, the Lord's got a good body for you. See, now you're really touching me base now here. All right. Look what it says, verse 4. For while we are still in this tent right here, we groan under the burden and sigh deeply, weighted down, depressed, oppressed. Not that we want to put off the body that is this tent, the clothing of the spirit. Notice that, the clothing of the spirit. But rather that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal, our dying bodies, may be swallowed up by life after the resurrection. How many of you know that all of us in here, our bodies are dying? Yeah. It's the last thing I do is I'm going to hold on to this dying body. I will not let it go. Yes, you will. <laughs> I can't take it with me. I'm not going. Oh, yes, you will. I want you to see the blessing in all of this. Does anybody see any blessings in this? 
Yeah, man, this is blessing. This is glorious. <laughs> All right, let's move. What did we say? Let's finish. Okay, we got that. Let's move to the next verse. Now he who has fashioned us, preparing and making us fit for this very thing is God. So what is God doing right now? He's making us fit for this very thing, to get rid of this old body and to get on the celestial body, the glorified body, who also has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the fulfillment of, this, of his promise. Now, what is his promise? We will get a brand new body, a glorified body. Now, let's hold our place right there, and uh, let's turn to uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Now, I know this disturbs the natural mind. Now, I know some of you are rejoicing in this. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, okay, up on the board. There we go. Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But we are citizens of the state, the commonwealth homeland. Where is it at? Which is in heaven. What's your address up there? From it also we earnestly and patiently await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah as Savior. So our citizenship is in heaven. See, this would blow the natural church member out of his pew. We thought it was all down here. No, it's all up there. We're just down here for a while. Our citizenship is in heaven. This is a temporary tent, a temporary journey. All right. Let's go to the next verse. See how calm I was, John? Now, who will transform? Who will transform? Who, who, who will? Who will transform? Who will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation to conform to and be like the body of his glory and the majesty. In other words, we're going to have a body just like Jesus Christ. See, this thing is bigger than just having our sins forgiven and going to church. This is eternity. This is exciting. Wow. What a future we have. Notice what it says. By exerting that power which enabled him even to subject everything to himself. And that is his power of the Holy Ghost. He will fashion so when Christ returns to earth, the body is going to come out of the grave and it will be fashioned just like the body of Jesus Christ. Never will die again. No more cancer. No more uh, going to the dentist. No more shots. No more sorrow. Perfect life power. Be able to explore the universe. A glorified body just like the body of Jesus Christ. God planned all of this. This was all planned by God. And we're st many people are just stuck down here in the mud. My sins are forgiven. Well, that's wonderful. Mine is too. But it's bigger than that, church. Much bigger than that. So much bigger than that. Glorious. Whew. Our scientist is out there. They're looking up there with that telescope. When we're gone, and they'll be looking up there in that telescope, and they'll see my face. <laughs> hey, I got another planet. Hey, that looks like my neighbor, Bob Tilton. <laughs> Folks, this is big deal we're talking about here. This is big, man, it's big. 
Woo! Glory. Won't need my glasses. Take my false teeth out. Throw them away. My wig don't need it no more. Got a brand new body. Come on, Jesus. No more groaning, no more moaning. Come on, Jesus. No more temptations. Hallelujah. All right, church, let's move on before we get happy. All right, go back to uh, 2 Corinthians. Forward to 2 Corinthians. All right, we, we said that, but let's read that again. That's good. Preparing and making us fit. Now, that's God. He's doing something. He's making us fit. How many is ever, men, how many times your wife has taken you to the to belts or some other place in these, they're going to fit you with a suit. How many enjoyed that once? Huh? Anyway, now notice this. We have the Holy Spirit. He's our guarantee that we're going to get this glorified body. This is a promise. So keep that in mind. Let's go to verse 6 now. So then we are always full of good and hopeful and confident courage. Why? Because you know about this promise of whatever's wrong with you physically. It's only a very temporary little thing, and it's going to pass. But one day we're going to be fitted with a glorified body. And you won't need no more keys to the house. You just walk through the door. That's right. Just walk through the door. How many know that? Raise your hand if you know that. Yeah, how, how do I know that? I've read the Bible. Remember when they, the disciples were in the upper room and the doors were locked and Jesus appeared? How do you get in? Snuck in through the window. His glorified body. He's there. Yep, he's gone. I love it. All right, let's finish. So then we are always full of good and hopeful and confident courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, this body right here, we are abroad from the home with the Lord that is promised us. So long as we're in this body, we're not in the body that he's promised us. We're all caught up with this body. I think it's time let's get caught up with the resurrected, glorified body. You look in the mirror in the morning, talk to yourself. Old body, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Lord has promised me a new glorified no more weight problems. I've gained 20 pounds in the last year. It's all Justine's fault. <laughs> Making those cakes. <laughs> you know I'm kidding now, you know. All right. <laughs> I tell it's my wife's fault, Susan. All right. Look at this now. Let's read that again. And let's make sure we understand the word of God. This is new to some of you. If you've never heard, had the Bible broken down like this in these areas, you'd be fine how much, if we could do it every night, what you'd learn. So then we are always full of good and hopeful and confident courage. We know that while we are at home in these bodies right here, we are abroad, we are away from the home which with the Lord that is promised us. So we just have to endure till he comes, and one day all oh, this will be done away with. We'll have our glorified bodies, and we'll never have to worry about none of this stuff anymore. Hold on, church. We're almost there. All right, next. For we walk by faith. We regulate our lives and conduct ourselves by our conviction or belief. In other words, we... We speak what we believe, not what we feel. Remember that scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, I think it is. Or 
or belief, respecting man's relationship to God and divine things with trust and holy fervor. Thus we walk not by sight or appearance. So we walk by faith. I was talking to my grandchildren the other day when they came over, and uh, they're old enough to listen to me now. And they couldn't understand a little something about the spiritual things. And when I was talking, I said, well, do you love your mother? Yeah, I love mama. Explain that to me. What is love? Duh. Well, how tall is it? How long is it? Explain what? How? Wow. Makes your tired tongue, doesn't it? I said, would you give your life for your mother? Yes, I would. Well, how do you know you love her? I just know. See, God reveals to our spirit. We just know that we know that we know by the Spirit of God. He reveals these things to us by His Spirit. And you know that you know that you know. When I look in the mirror, you think that I, I pay any attention to what I look like in the mirror? No. I know inside I'm a good-looking man. Come on, church. When I look in the mirror, do I look like I'm a righteous man? I know that I'm a righteous man. I have his righteousness. It's been imparted to me. See, you know things by the Spirit of God. And there are people that don't know things because they're not connected to, to God. But when you're connected to God, you know that you know that you know that you know by the Spirit of God, okay? I know God loves me by the Spirit of God, but I also know that God loves me by His Word, which is forever settled in heaven. All right, let's move on, and we're going to have to close down here. To, I can't believe it. Five more minutes. Okay, where are we at? Verse 7. All right, so we walk by faith and not by appearance. <coughs> Next, verse 8. Here we go. Yes, we have confidence and hopeful courage and are pleased rather to be away from home, these homes, out of these bodies, and be at home with the Lord in our new glorified bodies. Now look at that. Yes, we have confidence and hopeful courage and are pleased rather to be away from from home out of the of the body that we're in right now and be at home with the Lord. Now, let's bring it down to simplicity. We don't want to go out here and, and, and shoot ourselves, okay, just to get our new home. We're here to occupy until he comes. And remember, he has promised us a brand new body. I look at it like you have a kid and you say, now when you graduate, daddy's going to buy you a brand new car. And that kid's going to be looking forward to that brand new car. Well, our daddy, our heavenly father, has promised us a brand new body one day. No more of this stuff that we go through now. So take courage. Lift up your eyes and realize this is all temporary down here. The Lord has ascended into heaven. He's preparing a home for us, and he's going to do it, and we can rest in that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for the promises of God, and we give you honor and glory. Thank you, Lord, that your strength is sufficient as we're down here living in these tents until you come to get us, and we're looking forward to it. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Okay, any questions?